Hi everybody, and welcome back to my channel, Librarian California, where I'm gonna do my wrap up for my nonfiction November reads. I've tried to be as eclectic as possible um, to show people that, you know, nonfiction can be all over the place. It's not just one genre, so we really shouldn't think about it like that because some people just have an idea of what, like, what that is. Like, oh, that just means biographies or history or whatever that is. So I'm gonna try to like go crazy here and get out of the box. Now I didn't follow the, uh, the, the, the four words I think it was, but I decided to take my own little twist on it and I'm gonna try to connect these in some little way, but they're pretty eclectic. So let's just start from the beginning. So the first thing I read this month is called The Prince Zine. And literally it's about the musician Prince. And if you're a huge fan of Prince, you should absolutely read this zine. It is super in depth. It's the fourth edition of this zine. It's really detailed. There's good illustrations and drawings in there, tons of information. I am not a huge Prince fan, so why in the hell would I read this? Well, I'll tell you. It's part of our new zine collection at our library, and I bought it because I'm trying to make amends with some things. So my junior year in college, I sublet an apartment with two girls one summer, and one of them got up at 5 a.m. every single morning, Monday through Friday, to get ready for work and blared Prince at 5 a.m. every single morning. And so I didn't know waking up, was it gonna be a little red Corvette day? Was it gonna be purple rain? Was it gonna be when doves cry? I didn't know how my day was gonna go. But every single day, I heard Prince music every morning at 5 a.m. We've had some distance from that time, so I thought I'd take a chance and read it since it was in our collection. Super interesting. There's one thing in there that like blew my mind about it. So. Did you know the reason we have parental advisories on music, so like on CDs and labels on, on music, is because Prince pissed off Al Gore's wife, Tipper Gore, over his lyrics. And she decided to form a group of women to take on the music industry and rid it of all this filth. And literally that's what happened. That was the result of it. I had no idea. So parental advisories, because Tipper Gore got pissed off at Prince's lyrics. Like, like what? Like that is not how I would have thought like parental advisory on music came about and those labels and just like never thought of it. So anyways, uh, that was the coolest thing I read in there, uh, I thought, but uh, there's plenty of other information. If you're a Prince fan, you should totally read it. Um, widely available, great art. I mean, look at even the cover art. I mean, like, that's awesome. So anyways, uh, the illustrations were done by Rachel Lee uh, Carmen, and it was done, it was written by Joshua James Amberson. So totally recommend it. And if you've ever had to wake up to Prince every morning for three months at 5 a.m., let me know below in the comments. So the second book, total departure <laughs> from a Prince scene. And it's Carolyn Finney's Black Faces, White Spaces, uh, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors. So here it is here. There might be a little shine in there, but um, anyways, I read this as part of a book club that I was helping facilitate on campus. It was a virtual book club and uh, they're the ones who chose it. And I was just helping facilitate with questions in that. Interesting topic, but, but, but okay, listen to me here a second. Before you rush out and read it, it seems like an interesting topic. Like, let me give you one caveat about it. This is an academic book. This is um, published by the University of North Carolina Press. This reads like an academic book. It, it kind of also reads like it was their dissertation and turned into book form. So if you're expecting like an, like an easy read or something that's you know made for mass publication and you know, it was written by, like you say, a journalist, uh, you know, on a topic that, you know, is really like, you can just take it all in and that, like, this is not that book. Um, interesting topic about, uh, like I said, um, African-Americans relationship, the outdoors, it goes back through a lot of history, um, covers lynching and it covers uh, different parts of the country, it covers a lot about the Bureau of Land Management, um, federal employment in the National Park Service. Um, it, it covers a lot of information, uh, good topic, gives you a good history on why there is kind of um, a lack of African-Americans in a lot of outdoor spaces. So 
It's a good history about it. Um, the Carolyn's background is she's a cultural geographer and she is at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, or at the time of this publication she was, I don't know if she's still there. I will say it's not a long book though, but if you don't have a background in like, there's a couple theories introduced there, like critical race theory. Um, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're into academic books, totally, you can read it. Um, even if you're not, you can totally read it. It's a short, it's a pretty short read too, but it, I can definitely see on Goodreads, I was looking at some of the comments in that, and there's definitely some people that didn't like the book. And, and I don't think they, in my opinion, I feel like what they didn't understand about the book was that this book has a, is a, it has a targeted audience. I mean, this is made for like to be used in a classroom and to be used in a seminar to, to bring in with other material and have great debates and conversations about it. You know, it could be in a history course, could be in a cultural geography course, could be in a, um, you know, a lot of different courses that I could see on a campus. Um, but yeah, but if that's not what you're looking for, like, like I said, it reads like it's a dissertation, put in, put in a book form. So if that's not your appeal, don't read it. But if that is, totally read it. It was interesting. I learned a ton of stuff. I knew some of it and some of the history, um, you know, of lynchings and things, but uh, didn't know much about, you know, like employment for um, African Americans in the Park Service and and still even, you know, how that is today and just in general about uh, African Americans' experiences with the outdoors. So the next three that I'm going to do are actually going to, I'm going to try to tie them together even though they're pretty far out there and different, but I'm going to do what I can to kind of loop them together. So the next book, I don't see people talk about these books, read these books on Goodreads. So I'm hoping like for nonfiction November, like this is out there. I read a cookbook and I read the whole damn thing and I found a bunch of recipes I want to make with it. So this is Jamie Oliver's Five Ingredients, Quick and Easy Food. So it's a, this is a behemoth book too, but you can read cookbooks. Like there's nothing wrong with that. And you know, this one has a lot of pictures in it too, but like I found a ton of stuff that like taking five simple ingredients that, you know, cause I'm getting kind of bored cooking under the pandemic here. Like I'm cooking a lot, like every single day. It's been going on for many, many months now. And I'm just like, oh, I was getting sick of just like making the same stuff over and over again. Like I can only eat tacos so many times. And let me tell you, I had a lot of tacos during quarantine, but this book is really good. And definitely, now don't get me wrong. There's definitely recipes. I'm like, I would not touch that just because of one of the ingredients or two of the ingredients I can't stand personally, but there's a ton of stuff. Like you can see there, like these are things that I want to make. All the little, those little pieces of paper are recipes that I want to try out. So you can read cookbooks. No, and I don't see anybody ever talk about this on, on, on Goodreads. So, um, and again, people, that's because a lot of people do just get recipes online, but I do think it's good to look at like somebody's compilation of recipes that they put together. I like the idea of just five ingredients because I can't see how a recipe has like a hundred ingredients, especially when you have to buy a whole jar of something, but you really only need like one or two tablespoons for it. Like that drives me nuts. So anyways, now going to take a big twist and turn here, but the next book I read was Circle of Treason. And this is the CIA account of traitor Aldrich Ames and the men he betrayed, uh, Sandra Grimes and Jean, and her name is not easy to pronounce, Vertif Fuel, Vertifuel, I'll just let you see it there. So, complete departure. We've got a musician, not um, musician prince. We've got an academic book. We've got a cookbook. Now we've got a book on a CIA traitor. This book takes place in the Cold War. Uh, it's definitely about, you know, there's a lot Russian spies, American spies, trading spies, but there was a mole inside the CIA and for a long time, and a lot of their assets from Russia were lost. And even after, you know, the Cold War was winding down and things like this still was unsolved. And, and I like the Cold War, I should say, like, as I, I have a history background, I do like the Cold War, I think it's very fascinating. But here, here's the, you might be like, I don't give a crap about Cold War history, but like, these two women were the ones, along with a group of other people that brought him down. Um, it's really interesting to read about women in the CIA and early on. So you've got Sandra and Jean, like these are some of the first career officers, people who had like, like legit jobs as in a CIA office as an agent and not just seen as like a secretary, an administrative person, a typist, because that is how women were seen early on in the CIA. And so it's really interesting to see the history of this. You can see their career trajectories in there. You can see... You know, 
they worked with the trader for a long time. Um, it's just really fascinating. So I really liked it. There's also like, it was a while ago, it was turned into um, a mini series by ABC. It's called The Assets. I don't know if you can find that somewhere and watch it, but anyways, Ultra Games, like this was really good. Again, Cold War, loved it. Now, I'm gonna combine cooking and spies with, I read this book by Laura Shapiro on Julia Child. So it's a small um, penguin reader. It's not, you know, it's not a very big book. But, uh, so I had known that Julia Child uh, was a spy at some point. Turns out this book doesn't really cover it. It just mentions it at the very end and you should read a different book. So that was kind of disappointing. But I was like, it's a nonfiction November. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull some of these things together. I'm gonna make these things go together. So I was like, food, spies. I'm gonna go back to food and spies. But turns out that's not the case. But it is uh, just basically a biography of Julia Child, how she got started, her early on, um, her love of French food, and and you know how she broke into you know the cooking world and 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 television and all these things. Um, I will say, this is partly why sometimes I don't read biographies because like I learn a lot about people and they just kind of disappoint me. And uh, yeah, that kind of happened with this one. But I was glad the author did not shy away from this. So uh, Laura um, Shapiro, so again, most of it is just by, you know, early life, um, you know, childhood, education, college, living in France. A lot of it's about her husband being in the foreign uh, service agency, uh, in foreign service, and he was stationed in France. And a lot of it's about cooking and trials and tribulations and and her cooking show. And, and just a lot of it's on the, the cookbook, the massive cookbook that she tried to produce and how many iterations it had to go before it could get published. And um, so all that stuff is like probably mostly known and interesting. Here's some things that I was kind of like, whoa. Um, or just, you know, like she had a real problem with housewives. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, you know, and I think it's interesting because like she was trying to bring French cooking to America. And, you know, how do you convince you know, who was the audience for this book? And she just didn't like housewives and just, and now you got to understand the time here. We're talking about the forties and fifties. There's a lot of introduction to, you know, TV dinners. This is TV dinners, canned food, frozen food, like, um, convenience. This is definitely the, the rise of all of this in the United States. You got to have this little context there. So how then do you get to get people to make really, um, kind of like, difficult and long, you know, a lot of processes, a lot of, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of ingredients, but a lot of time and effort to do this. But anyway, so that was interesting that she kind of had this like riff with housewives, like for a long time. Another thing was interesting is that as a woman trying to break into kind of the cooking world, like she had a problem with women cooks early on because she just considered them housewives. And that was kind of just like demeaning the profession. So she actually like wanted more men to be chefs in America because that would help. And she could get more men, male chefs in America to cook French food, like that would be better. So it's interesting because she does talk, um, you get a lot of background information about France, but what's really interesting is like, she leaves out some things like, and the author kind of points this out that like, depending on what class you were in France, like, there was the same people who were getting this, like the convenience food, the canned food, the fr the frozen food, the TV dinners. Whereas people who had means like, and that worked or, you know, did cultural activities, philanthropy and stuff, like they had cooks that produced this French cuisine. So it's not that like France was devoid of convenience food. It's just that, you know, she just didn't really see it that way. So that was interesting. So you got this like back and forth about like, you know, is France up on this pedestal and like there were some similarities and differences and, and, you know, very interesting. Then like, I was a little shocked about like, I'm not shocked. Wait, let me rephrase that. She was an old white, well-to-do woman. Uh, again, you know, she died in like 2004 in like her nineties, but you know, early on, like she wanted men in the profession, but she didn't want homosexuals because she, she thought that might ruin the profession. So you definitely learn about her, like she was, you know, a homophobe, but again, that wasn't a surprise at the time at all. But, um, but it's interesting. The author does cover like how she kind of like went in waves of like being a homophobe, but then understanding and then being a homophobe again, but then like 
seems like there was a turning point when she had a dear friend who died during the AIDS epidemic and had a long, you know, death, uh, you know, painful death. And then it was kind of like an awakening. And then, but she was really like good friends with like James Beard, um, the, the, you know, famous chef and you know, he was a homosexual. And so it was like this like weird things, but like she definitely like uh, ebbed and flowed on her opinions about homosexuality. So that was interesting. So the author doesn't shy away from like that topic, which I thought was interesting, especially in a small book. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was really interesting was, um, you know, early on in her career, she tried decided that she wasn't going to be like endorsing products and she wasn't going to, you know, didn't want to be like the spokesperson for things. Um, she just wanted to stay out of that kind of thing and didn't want, you know, like what if a bad product was associated with her? And so that was kind of, you know, like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but you, you kind of lose out on a lot of, uh, sorry, just kicked my, uh, kicked my tripod there. Um, but you lose out on a lot of like sponsorship and money in that. But, um, but they were well off. I mean, she had seemed like she got quite a big inheritance. They had made a lot of money off of her books and, and so money wasn't an issue. But, uh, but anyways, what may be surprising is like, she was definitely a supporter of like big agribusiness, big, big agribusiness. And like definitely was not a fan of like organic farming, um, small farming, um, you know, like these small food movements that were going on, like she wasn't having that. So that's really interesting because like, if you think about like how cuisine and food has, you know, evolved in the US, again, like she died in 2004, but like, you know, it is that move towards like, you know, organic, buying local, um, diversifying, like not, you know, like kind of big ag has this like stigma attached to them. And one would think with like the fine cuisine that you would find that you would be, you know, make from walking through like a French market and, and trying to replicate in America. And like, it's really interesting because like I, people I think are surprised that like she sided with, like was a big supporter of like big ag, you know, the, the mechanical food industry, so that was kind of like a surprise, I think. Uh, I just think she was kind of off on where fine cuisine was going. Uh, the book kind of ends up uh, um, in uh, California and because she did live in the East Coast, had a home in um, Provence, France, and then ended her life in Santa Barbara, California. And like the California food cuisine and the California food movement and all these things, like that was kind of lost on her, it seemed. Um, and uh, Shea Panisse in San Francisco, and it talks about that and just like kind of how the direction that food was going was not in the direction that she had been a part of or supported or, or kind of how she saw things. So it's definitely interesting. So for a short little book, like I learned a ton of information. So that, that was good. But again, I wish it was gonna cover that she was a spy, but basically they just acknowledged that like, um, there was a couple other books that you should read on different topics related to her. So that was kind of disappointing because I wanted to tie the food, the cookbook to the, the spy um, nonfiction book that I read about the traitor and then tie it back into like food and spies, but it didn't work out that way. But anyways, um, very interesting reads. So again, like my nonfiction November, that's my wrap up. So I hope you enjoyed it again. Nonfiction is such a wide area. It's like, yes, it's a genre, but like within it is so many subgenres. So again, hopefully this made you think about areas that you would never think about reading in or just kind of be like, wow, that was really eclectic there. So anyways, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and I'll see you next time.